Dr. Lubchenco has long provided scientific input to the federal government, particularly on oceanic and climate issues. She served on the first National Academy of Sciences study on global warming, served 10 years on the National Science Board, served as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and led a four university team of scientists investigating marine ecosystems along the west coast of the United States. She also has a special interest in Arctic ecosystems. Her scientific work is widely cited in academic journals. In fact, she's in the top one half of 1% of the most commonly cited ecologists in the world. She's also one of those people that we all love to hate but secretly wish we were among, a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Grant. <laughs> <laughs> but her greatest contributions may be at the nexus of scientific and popular knowledge. She co-founded three organizations that focus on better communicating science to the public. The Aldo Leopold Leadership Program, which teaches environmental scientists to be effective communicators. The Communication Partnership for Science and the Sea which helps marine scientists specifically in that regard, and Climate Central, which provides a source of understandable scientific information about climate science. With that emphasis, she's certainly a natural fit for the Grantham Seminar. And I certainly look forward to hearing her thoughts on the role of journalists and journalism in this regard. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lubchenco and Mr. Blakemore. First, some very quick context from a reporter of, for what it's like to be interviewing Dr. Lubchenco. Lubchenco, excuse me, I got it right this time. First uh, syllable is the emphasized one. Dr. Lubchenco um, as the administrator of NOAA, that is, she's in the government. Many of us who cover global warming and uh, general ecologically related matters where nature and human nature meet already knew her name, already knew her as a very interesting interview and somebody who could usually shed light for us as we were trying to bring the public up towards what they were beginning to see many decades ago in the scientific community about the crisis we now face. And just some very recent context to add a little bit of frisson to this particular gathering. In the last two or three weeks alone, there has been more reporting coming in from the field, not projections, but observations and projections um, about how the environment is proving to be much more sensitive, that's a term of art among scientists, than they thought it was even a year or two ago. The latest reports from the Greenland ice sheet this past uh, summer have concluded by showing us that they're starting to see signs of runaway melting at the edges of the Greenland ice sheet and that it's collapsing quicker than they thought it would. Here's an article, a world four degrees centigrade warmer by 2055. A year or two ago, we would have thought this unthinkable, and yet the UK Met Office has concluded that that's what we're headed to with business as usual. And another study that just came out, Juliet Alprin of the Washington Post was, I believe, the first person to report this, a UN study led by Robert Carell, who is uh, based here in this town, but is, is a name known to all of us as well, concluded that if all of the countries of the world fulfilled their current pledges for cutting greenhouse gases, we would still go up, I believe it was 6.3 degrees centigrade in this century. These are unthinkable figures for those of us who have been following this for a long time. The hope was that at the worst, it would go up two degrees centigrade by about mid-century, and we would have a chance of controlling the uh, worst of the um, dangerous impacts, to use a word that was applied in some treaties some time ago, and nobody can yet keep up with what the word dangerous might mean. Uh, Dr. Lubchenko is therefore um, somebody of great interest to us for another reason. We have come to understand that this isn't just about global warming or climate change. That's exactly half the problem in a certain sense. This is the carbon crisis, and there are, as she was among the first to uh, teach us, evil twins here. Ocean acidification, this horrible coincidence, is the other half of it, and in some ways more frightening. And Dr. Lubchenko is, of course, an oceanographer. This horrendous coincidence, apparently, that the molecule that we humans have been digging out of the earth for only about uh, a century and a half to provide our energy for our electricity-based civilization, the carbon molecule, happens by apparent devilish coincidence to affect the two fluid systems upon which our life depends and which enwrap the earth. The atmosphere, the fluid, borderless, constantly swirling, constantly mixing air, and the oceans, fluid, borderless, constantly mixing 
no borders at all, which makes it seem too often like a, more of a, politic, a politics story than it is. The carbon molecule happens to absorb infrared radiation while letting visible light through, as we've all been taught by the scientists, and therefore gives us global warming. It also happens to combine with H2O to form carbonic acid, and so we have ocean acidification. The administrator of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration has within her very title the two halves of this increasingly grave-looking crisis that faces us now. Dr. Lubchenko, there's one question that several people have asked me to ask you first. You've been six, <laughs> you've been now just over six months um, in this new position. And various people have put the question in different ways. How has your perspective changed since you've joined the feds or become a suit? <laughs> it, <laughs> Uh, it's been a really interesting transition, Bill. Um, in my previous life, I was really focused on pushing the boundaries of scientific knowledge and <clears throat> offering up information to decision makers to act on that information. And I really see a key role of science as uh, informing the decisions people make. And that, that, those words are chosen judiciously because I think that um, science should not dictate uh, what society chooses to do, but it should inform it. There are going to be a lot of other considerations that people take into account in making a decision, whether it's individuals or government officials or uh, business leaders. So science should be informing those decisions, <clears throat> and that's what I did in my former life. And, you know, part of that was not just discovering new knowledge, but synthesizing, integrating it, and making it relevant to the decision-making process. In this new role, um, NOAA does, does do that discovery and that communication, but we also are users of that same information. And so now I'm in a position where I actually have responsibility for making decisions based on that information. And it is, uh, it's actually a very exciting and energizing challenge because it's not enough to just provide the information. We have to be moving on with doing something. There must have been, though, many, many times when you were among the scientists looking at government and getting awful darn frustrated. You must have a new insight. It's only been six months, but already you're probably running into some frustrations in which you understand just why the scientists... It's, it's trading one set of frustrations for another set of frustrations. <laughs> Well, before we take anything for granted, before we go too much further, in a sentence or two, if possible, what is your job? Um, NOAA's portfolio is uh, excitingly broad. We are responsible as a science agency for new discoveries. Uh, we also provide services. We provide the weather service. We provide information about weather-related disasters. We provide information about fisheries. Uh, we provide climate services. We also have stewardship responsibilities for oceans and coasts. And so we like to say that we do everything from the bottom of the ocean to the surface of the sun. And in fact, we do have that entire portfolio. Um, traditionally at NOAA, Many of those different pieces, the satellites, the weather, the fisheries, the coasts, and the research enterprise have been fairly stovepiped. And one thing that we've been trying to do is build on my predecessor's attempts to integrate across those um, stovepipes and make it much more cohesive. And in the new positions, the new political positions that we will be um, filling in this administration, we're actively trying to act on that integration and not just perpetuate the wet side and the dry side that is encapsulated in our name, but focus on the science stewardship and services mission across the wet and the dry sides.